It seems like creatives always get a bad rap. From childlike tantrums and ridiculous green room requests, to strange superstitions, and even self-mutilation, it's clear that artists have plenty of strange habits. But they've also made a pretty big impact on the world. Hi, I'm Kate Rooney. And I'm Jess Scuffy. And you're listening to Creatives Are the Worst, presented by Design Pickle, the leading flat rate graphic design and creative services platform. In this podcast, we'll be uncovering the fascinating myths and shocking stories behind the artists we love, or in some cases, love to hate, as we try to determine, are creatives the worst? Welcome to Creatives Are the Worst, a podcast presented by Design Pickle. I am Jess Guffey, and I am joined by my very wonderful, very talented co-host, Kate Rooney. Hi, Kate. Hi, Jess. That was so lovely. And I, I really like your radio voice right now. Thank you. I don't know where it came from. Maybe it's because we're recording on a Sunday. We're kind of calm and zen, you know? Yeah. I always <laughs> feel really calm on a Sunday before I start my work week. I it's, agree. Uh, it's when I feel the most zen on a, on a Sunday night. <laughs> Namaste. As I, see, as I see my inbox filling up. 400 <laughs> emails. I just feel like the Sunday scares don't even exist, you know? Just watch what that are, inbox climb that? higher and higher. How has our voice gotten so much more calmer <laughs> as we record this? That's not us. That's not us. Oh, I'm a crazy That's person. It's literally nothing to do with us. But we're not here to talk about yoga or being Zen because we're clearly not Zen people. So I believe, Kate, you have a story for me today. Is that correct? I do, and I think it's fair to say that this person was not Zen either. But perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but before I launch into that, uh, or before I reveal who we're talking about today, of course, all of our sources are listed in the show notes below. And as much research as we do, trying to make sure we have everything accurate, uh, we're human, and we might slip up. So if you hear anything that uh, we've messed up, just shoot us an email at podcasts at designpickle.com. But yeah, we, we also have some insights, but those are just our personal opinions. So feel free to argue with us. Yeah. When, once we get our first hate mail, that's when we know that we've made it. <laughs> I did I think say that's that. That's true. <laughs> but Jess, I, I have something I have to confess to you. I'm ready. I may not always love you. <gasps> Excuse yeah. me? I was not prepared for as that. There, <laughs> as long as there are stars above you, you may you never need to doubt it. And I'll make you so sure about it because Jess, God only knows where I'd be without you. <gasps> wow. Did you just read me a poem? Well, close to it, because while it's true that uh, God only knows where I'd be without you, I think it's also safe to say that God only knows where the world would be without the Beach Boys. <gasps> Is this happening? Is this happen- it's happening? Are you lulling it's me happening. into a false sense of security and then going to do bait and switch and it's actually someone else? <laughs> <laughs> well, my bait and switch is that I'm specifically covering Brian Wilson, yes. the de facto leader of the Beach Boys and just an all-around musical visionary uh, who really revolutionized the whole world of pop, rock, and music production in general. I am so. so freaking excited. I love the Beach Boys. I am mm-hmm. I don't know much about his story, so this is going to be great. Well, me neither because I, I think as I mentioned to you before, <laughs> this is a classic Kate move, but <laughs> when I <laughs> I love the Beach Boys always have. I mean, I for, I born and raised in Southern California, so they definitely have a special place in my heart. But when I was discussing covering the Beach Boys with our producer, Arison, I thought I would be covering Dennis Wilson because he has a very interesting background, which we'll we'll touch on. So I was kind of like researching from the mindset of Dennis Wilson and and his tragic fall and whatnot. But our producer, Arison, was like, no, 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 no. Brian Wilson is the guy. He's the guy. And boy, is he the guy. So let's dive in, shall we? Tell me all about him. Okay, so Brian Wilson was born on June 20th, 1942 in Inglewood, California. Yup. Inglewood. Yeah, so the family moved to Hawthorne, which is kind of in the L.A. area. Uh, And at age 16, he was sharing a bedroom with his brothers, Dennis and Carl. Dennis, who I've mentioned before. 
And, you know, growing up, it was kind of like an outwardly really normal middle class suburban life. Uh, but it actually turned out that indoors things were a little bit rougher. Uh, some we've, we've got some daddy issues that we're dealing with here, per n- usual. Not an uncommon theme in our podcast. Yeah, no. So his, his father named Murray, who actually, uh, he was also a musician with relative success. Uh, but he ended up being the Beach Boys manager for some time. Oh. But his dad, Murray, was physically and mentally abusive. Now, I couldn't find more sources on his mom, but it's it's st- stated that she's likely an alcoholic. So just some factors going against him. But he said that, you know, he had a good childhood, except for his dad beating him up all the time. Oh, no. <laughs> really looking on the bright side of things. And it was known that he had uh, hearing issues in one of his ears, but... He also said that he lost 96% of his hearing in his right ear just because of his dad beating him. Oh, my God. Yeah. But regardless, he was just obsessed with music, even at a young age. Um, I mean, you could probably say that he turned to music to escape all the abuse in his his childhood. Uh, But just completely obsessed. Just would listen to, to musicians and harmonies and study them. Just you know, obsessed. And he would teach all of his family members how to harmonize. They're just a cute little family band. It's like the Von Trapps. (laughs) (laughs) But so much darker. (laughs) Yeah. So he and his brothers uh, would start performing at parties. And they also, uh, their their cousin, Mike Love, Mm. uh, who's another member of the Beach Boys, who, um, a a bit of a rough go with, with Mike Love, as we'll get into later. But he was their cousin, and he he kind of joined their quote unquote band. They perform at parties and whatnot, and then uh, they once they were in high school, they went to Haw- Hawthorne High School. It made me think of Hawthorne Heights, but I don't know if they're actually related. <laughs> <laughs> they continued performing and brought on their friend Al Jardine, who's also another member of the Beach Boys. Love it, and they for. I know. They formed a band called the Pendletones. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but this was like such a big thing when I was growing up. But uh, Pendletons are those like flannel shirts, but every surfer boy wore them. Like that was the that uniform. Doesn't of, surprise me. Yeah. That that was my high school experience was all the cute <laughs> surfer boys, their bleach blonde hair and their flannel Pendleton shirts, which oh, I thought was just so God. cute. What a yeah, vibe. so it was it was a play, I you know. It was a play off the that name, but it was the Pendletones. How clever. I know. <laughs> Th- this is kind of a sidebar, but have you ever watched the movie That Thing You Do? Mm-mm. Jess. I watch a lot of movies. I feel like I'm usually the one that's like, Kate, hey, you haven't seen this movie? Uh, Ugh. I I know, but now you All right. yeah, that's your homework now. You have to go watch that because I actually didn't realize because that movie came out when I was a lot younger, but so much of it is like basically the story of the Beach Boys, Are you but kidding? very similar. Okay, mm-hmm. well, I feel lots like of parallels there. This podcast is giving us a running list of pop culture items that we either need to watch or listen to, or albums that we need to go find. So I'm excited <sighs> about that because now we have stuff to fill our time. Add it to the list of things we don't have time for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Brian was on the bass, Carl and Al were on the guitar, Dennis is on the drums, Uh, Mike and Brian were the most of the lead vocals, but really every member contributed vocals because they were all harmonizing together. (laughs) I know, it's just like, oh, so wholesome and and so cute. Seriously, though. Now, (laughs) we're we're getting into the the 60s now, so it's early 60s, and the Pendletones record two demos of surfing theme songs. Oh. You may recognize these songs, uh, Surfin' and Surfin' Safari. Yup. Yup. I love that they, like, stuck with their theme, you know? They were like, we're gonna play off a classic surfer outfit, and we're just gonna go with that music, too. Love it. Well, funny you should mention that, because really, Dennis was the only one who surfed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of like common Beach Boys knowledge. They didn't actually surf, except Dennis did. He was... Yeah. Dennis was so cute. 
I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the Beach Boys when they're yes. younger, but he was like the the classic Southern California surfer dude. I would have had a big crush on him for sure. Do you think the rest of them were like, hey, dude, since we don't actually surf, we're going to need you to like kind of run with this a little bit since we don't know how to talk about it in a song. <laughs> and he was like, sure, dudes. Gnarly, Whatever. bro. Surf's up. It's fine. Don't harsh my mellow. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian did say that he tried surfing once, but the board, he said, the board almost hit me in the head. Oh, boy. Like, okay. Yeah, that that happens. Yep. I mean. Yep. And Murray, their dad, who's also kind of their, their manager at the time, said, they had written a song called Surfing, which I never did like, and I still don't like. It's so crude and rude. <laughs> That's the best Is insult it? that you could come up with. It's crude and it's rude. Okay, bro. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's not but okay yeah <laughs> so at this time they they were picked up by a small label and the label renamed the group the beach boys to, mm. to kind of capitalize on that whole surfer culture vibe whatever now there's this whole like they really created what's called california sound and that is i mean it's the beach boy sound it captures like that sunny youthful culture yep. of southern california and i think that again like that's why it's so near and dear to my heart because it makes me think of growing up by the beach yeah. just like that carefree but they that's like that's what they established and so they're called the beach boys now and really capitalizing on that california sound and the the beach boys or the former pendle the pendle tones were <laughs> kind of like confused by it or just like really we're gonna go with this but it worked now I, I had a reference here to that thing you do because right after this happened uh one of the members al left for dentistry school and i had all these alarm bells going off because that's exactly <laughs> what happens in that thing you do like they took that story verbatim amazing uh-huh but so now they're the beach boys they're creating albums, and Surfin' Cracks, the Billboard Top 100, peaked at number 75, and Surfin' Safari reached the top 20. So they're they're getting, like, pretty good uh, coverage yeah. here. And earned them a contract with Capitol Records, the famed Capitol Records. Moving on up. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> I literally wrote in here, which is so stupid, the first wave of success. <laughs> Just need to add more surfer puns. So I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they released their full uh, album, their first like full album called Surf and Safari, which was number 32 on the album charts. And at this point, like Brian is definitely still the the primary creative leader, always, always was, always has been, uh, even when they were younger. But it really, as I said before, that whole like California style is really bright and cheery and representing the California youth culture. Um, so they continued with that with Surfing USA, Aww. Surfer Girl, Little Deuce Coop. They all broke the top 10. So just, again, riding that wave to success. <laughs> don't let the board hit you on the head on the way out because... Eek. Dun, dun. Now we're getting into the 60s here. Oh, and boy. Glorious 60s. Brian really starts to experiment musically, but also... Chemically, mm, knew that was coming. Yeah, they really wanted to like he or he wanted to push their sound beyond like this kind of light, airy pop formula. Uh, so he just put everything into creating music, um, and they were having massive success. I mean, like I said, all of those songs that they had before, all the surfing, surfing girl songs, they were all in the top one hundred. Yeah. So they were touring all over the place. And uh, in nineteen sixty four, they were on a plane from LA heading to Houston for a show and Brian just has like a full on nervous breakdown <gasps> just no. yeah just from like the pressure of the performing schedule and everything uh in the middle of the flight he just like starts crying and shrieking oh, and God. screaming into a pillow sobbing on the floor of the the floor of the plane yeah. is it a floor I, I mean, guess it is you're in the air but it's still a floor yeah, no, no one really knew what to do with him. They're just watching him have this breakdown and being like, maybe we should turn around and go back. I don't know. I also feel like it's really hard to deal with stuff like that in the 60s because they weren't 
knowledgeable about like how to handle those situations Mm. and it was almost looked as like you're weak if you have a nervous breakdown like let's not take into consideration Mm -hmm. everything that's going on in your life let's just like call you crazy or classify you as something and put you in a box rather than dealing with it head-on yeah and it gets worse oh no so I know. So at this point, because of his his breakdown, he stopped performing with the Beach Boys and really took everything. Like when he stopped performing with them, he instead of just getting better, he concentrated on songwriting and studio production. So he just moved all his energy into creating more music. And he explains in an article, he says, I felt like I had no choice. I was run down mentally and emotionally because I was running around, jumping on jets from one city to the to another on one night stands, also producing, writing, arranging, singing and planning and teaching to the point where I had no peace of mind and no chance to actually sit down and think or even rest. So just a full on yeah. overwhelm. And I feel like a lot of people have felt that. I mean, not not to that level where you're like one of the most famous bands in the right. world, but just like, I can't stop working. I have no time to even just like sit and be and I also feel like for artists one of the things that we've kind of seen in our research thus far is that they get really overwhelmed when they're not able to do exactly what they want to do and you mentioned that Uh he was kind of trying to want to experiment with different sounds and possibly get away from the stuff that had made them so famous and it's like maybe that contributed to it because he just he was like screw this like I'm not writing music and producing music that I'm absolutely in love with sure it's commercially successful but like I want to do what I want to do and make music that I want to make so I wonder if that contributed to it exactly I mean you think about the songs that that drove the Beach Boys to like huge massive acclaim and it's those light poppy sounds and he yeah he had more depth to him and he was he was a musical genius I mean without a doubt so he wanted to really experiment with stuff but instead, he ends up experimenting with um, some other substances. So, oh, Brian. <laughs> no, I mean, it's Brian. The, it's the 60s. Come on. I mean, True. what else are you going to do? So he's, he, he was first introduced to marijuana, the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, drug abuse resistance education taught us that. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Dare? Mm-hmm. I remember Dare. <laughs> There's a whole song. Do you remember the song? What's the Dare song? I'm not going to sing it. Oh, I'm not going to sing it. If you knew it, I would sing it with you, but nope. Okay, we'll we'll uh, record that later. Exactly. When we're watching that thing you do. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he started some he started smoking the ganj. Okay. And it actually he said it helped him alleviate his stress and inspired creativity. So, that's positive. Marijuana has been known to have that effect on people. Yeah, so he, he actually completed some other albums for the Beach Boys. He wasn't touring with them this time, but he was still, like, composing all the music and okay. doing the production. Now, later, uh, he has his first acid trip, and this oh, is a, definitely a, piv- a pivotal moment here. Yeah. Now, on one side, it, it had a, his first uh, acid trip had a major effect on his musical conceptions, but he also kind of had a bad trip. Oh, God. I'm sure you're familiar with the the whole concept of ego death. So uh, this is something that that can happen when you are on LSD Mm. or whatever, psycho, psycho act, no, some sort of psycho drug. Hallucinogenics. (laughs) But basically, it's like you see everything and realize how little you are as a person and uh, okay. it's called ego death because you're it's death of the ego you no longer have this grandiose ego it's more like we are all one and it can be really traumatic for people some people also think it's very enlightening but he experienced it and during his uh, his trip he was again freaking out screaming into a pillow thinking about his parents and how much they messed him up how awful they were and he was just scared freaked out and so what he does while he's still tripping is he turns to music. So he walks downstairs, he sits on his p- uh, piano and starts playing. Starts playing this one melody over and over again. And it's da 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 Oh, um, man. Yeah, or I'm probably saying that wrong. But da 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 But it's, it, it's basically he's coming up with the song California Girls. Oh. 
I, I know it's so weird because we're talking about dark stuff, but I can hear both of us going, oh, I know. oh because it's just so nostalgic. And yes. I love that song. I love that song so, so much because, well, Same. I'm a California girl, and so it's all true. Uh, but it's brilliant. Like, the that first, like, 20 seconds of the song is just, like, you're getting all hyped up for it, and then the yeah. vocals come in. Everything's all layered. It's beautiful. And, I mean, that obviously inspired so many musicians later on, including yeah. uh, just Katy Perry and her fantastic, game-changing hit, California Girls with the U. With Snoop Dogg <sighs> on the track. That was the best part of that song. <laughs> Can't forget that. Um, quick question. I... I've been thinking about this as you've been talking about his experimentation with substances. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could put a percentage on the great musical hits that have been a product Mm. of hallucinogenics or psychoactive drugs, because we all know the Beatles went through that phase. I'm sure we could name thousands of other artists that have been public about their, their experimentation, but it really does seem like more often than not, acid trips produce really good music for people it's weird they certainly did in the 60s yeah but as you'll come to see it also really really effed them up oh, so boy. they did world like truly history changing music but also um just ruined his life yeah really so because of this so he he's he comes up with the idea for, or he comes up with a melody for California Girls and also some of the lyrics. Like, I think the first line of that song he came up while he was on this trip and he just really wanted to write a song. It's just about how awesome California girls are. Like, yeah, <laughs> we are. That's We're at, true. Right. Oh, yeah. So, but also because of this trip, he started suffering from auditory hallucinations which is oh, can be very common no. when when people experiment with lsd but also when they're uh probably a predisposition for mental health issues that can like trigger mm. it so it's unclear if that's what triggered these hallucinations but it carried with him for the rest of his life having these terrible auditory hallucinations did you know that you probably know this but uh, you know, in several neurobiology classes in college, we talked about the effect of drugs and LSD is the only drug that can remain in your system for like eternity. So like what it does is it can get trapped in your spine. So like you could literally crack your back and then have a trip with LSD. I'm not kidding. It's like actual science proven. Wild. <laughs> My eyeballs are so big right now. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I that stuck with me like I couldn't tell you anything else but I just remember being horrified by that because people are like affected they did it one time and then it carries with them their entire lives so I I didn't know that I just I just knew that if you have like schizophrenia for example yep that could trigger that or bipolar disorder if that was undiagnosed and you have a bad trip yes uh it could make it rise to the surface which is interesting in one way too because does that mean that it would never have appeared later in life? Right. Or you know, who knows? If you not know, us, we're not doctors. If you know, please <laughs> let us know. If you are a doctor or a psychiatrist specifically, please let us know. Uh huh. So after this point, I mean, he continues experimenting with psychotropics for the next few years. That was actually the word that I was looking for before, not psychodrugs, but psychotropics. So now we're in the the mid. 60s or 1965 and he starts working on his new project which you may have heard of called pet sounds oh. <laughs> uh and uh, man i listened to so much of the beach boys while i was researching for this particularly pet sounds because it's just a magical album and it, that was i mean this was like his passion project really and he wanted to create an album where every song mattered there was no no filter tracks like every song was important love that uh uh-huh. he he uh ended up collaborating with uh, this guy named tony asher on a lot of the lyrics interesting tidbit though asher was a, a an advertising person like he wrote jingles for <gasps> advertising companies no so way. He was basically, yeah like he was basically able to take Bri- brian's crazy ideas fueled by lse and turning them into like catchy lyrics and compositions what a niche um, that profession is 
a jingle writer. Right? That's so fascinating to me. I think it's so interesting to take someone from like the marketing and advertising world and how that can apply to to music too, yeah. to make something that's, you know. I've never thought of that. Should we try to write some songs? Uh, I mean, I've written plenty that's of true. songs that I've that's sent true. to you. I, I wouldn't say that they're pet sounds uh, level, but <laughs> I wouldn't say they also have the commercial sing. appeal yet. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there, Kate. Sure, sure. <laughs> I, I love this though. Asher Asher's first impression of, of Brian was that he was the single most irresponsible person he had ever met. <laughs> oh boy. And yeah, recalls one time there were uncashed royalty checks of up to one hundred thousand dollars just what? scattered all over Brian Wilson's house. <laughs> if Hire if that isn't a business a creative, manager. <laughs> If that doesn't just wrap up what a creative is, I don't know what. Like, just wildly irresponsible, yep. really bad with money, but man, just making the most brilliant art just you've ever seen in your life. bangers out on the reg, but can't cash a check. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sums it up. Uh, so Pet Sounds is, is revolutionary in a lot of ways, but really in just how it was all created. Because typically, you know, in the 50s and early 60s, people are they have their band and they're writing their music and yep. recording it as you do. But uh, Brian had this vision to incorporate just like a ton of different musicians and instruments that had never really even been utilized before mm. in music. And he hired this really famous uh, session group called the wrecking crew. Love and that was that just like name. a, uh, right. It's basically like a conglomeration of a bunch of different musicians who perform four different recording sessions and stuff like that. But they've, they've performed with like a ton of different famous um, uh, pop stars and whatnot, but he hired them. They would come in, record bits and pieces. And basically pet sounds was recorded like a movie or put together, like how you would put to produce a movie. So hmm. in, like I said, instead of like playing all the instruments together and then uh, editing that sound, Brian would perfect the sound of each instrument separately Whoa. and like go hardcore to make sure it was absolutely perfect and using weird techniques, but then would like put it all together later. But really, it, it, like he did it all. He produced, arranged, and composed everything on this album. Um, and just, it was, it's so gorgeous. Just all these like layered harmonies and like d lots of like, orchestrated uh almost like symphony music and just weird yeah. things like keys jangling and uh the the, the famous theremin coming in uh, do you know what the theremin is it's one of my favorite instruments because it's so weird <laughs> no but please enlighten me <laughs> yeah so it's it's that weird instrument where it's almost like people are playing the air Oh, it's okay. Like, okay. It's, it's very haunting sounding. It's really cool. You know what? Not to interrupt you, but as you're like saying all these instruments and talking about how he perfected each one, something that always fascinates me about specifically musicians, but I think we could translate this into all creatives and their specific art, but like they have such a bigger vision. And if you look at the individual pieces, it's like, this makes no sense. Like keys jingling mm -hmm. in a song. What are you doing, bro? Like get out of here. But they have this vision and they're able to put the little pieces together one by one to make it something whole. And I just wonder how that affects the people around them, because you and I would be like, dude, like, we trust you. But like, this makes no sense. And yeah. it's just well, such well, a common thing. Think about it thing. this way. This is this is a bit of a stretch for an analogy. But think about when we were coming up with this this podcast and how, you know, it's, it's a weird concept. We had to, like, pitch that we have this vision for it. And we're just hoping, like we're, yeah, ha we have our awesome producers helping us put the pieces together, and we had to like pitch it to people. And we, there's some doubt, but we have this vision. We're we're working to make it happen, and it's all these small pieces that so true we put together, just with a little bit less LSD. I would say, <laughs> I would say a hundred percent less LSD. <laughs> <acid>. <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, but he, he's working on this album literally nonstop. The, similar to other people that we've covered. I mean, people said he was, he was either at his piano working, he was in the studio arranging, or he was eating. Like, that was it. Like, hardly sleeping, nothing. Shocking. Um, said no one mm -hmm. ever. 
<laughs> and this was really like the first concept album. I mean, the whole, if you listen to all the songs, it's, it's a story of a romantic relationship, really like these young kids and going through all of that. One of my favorite albums of all time is The Hazards of Love by The Decemberists. And it's, that's basically like a rock opera, but it's, it's not on the same plane as, I mean, just that similar concept where it is the story that you're telling through your music, but it's very unusual. I love that. Um, I love when artists are able to do that in an album. I just think it's so unique and it makes it so much more interesting and exciting to listen to because you're like, holy shit, what's going to happen next? (laughs) What's the next song about? I got to figure out what the story is. I know. It makes you want to keep listening and listening in order because that's one thing too is that, Music's so different now where you find things on streaming or Spotify or whatever. And so you're kind of listening to them one off instead of all the way through how this was intended to be listened to. Uh, Also, another quick little sidebar. I mean, as I was listening to all the music, my poor husband was just so sick of hearing the Beach Boys (laughs) over and over again. But I, every time another song would come on, be like, oh my God, I love this one. Uh, But I just kept thinking about like, well, that song sounds like this artist, and this sounds like this artist, like you can just tell so many, uh, you you know, just like current artists have basically like without the Beach Boys, without Brian Wilson, without Pet Sounds, they wouldn't exist today. And one, one example, I know you love Fleet Foxes. I do too. I almost couldn't distinguish like a Fleet Foxes song between a song on Pet Sounds. Like they sound very similar. Mm -hmm. But also like, Because it was still, you know, still the 60s, and they they still had a lot of commercial success. Pet Sounds was almost kind of written off as, like, you know, sugary pop, just regular, Mm. that California style. But some of the the lyrics are pretty dark, if you really listen to it. And I I read an article that said, like, it almost brings out this existential fear. And that's so true. That's, like, the perfect way to put it. You kind of... I think it's, it's the way the music is all... Um, the way it's composed and how it's uh, like weird. You do have these unique sounds and things right. that are like reversed in the weird way that you wouldn't expect to kind of like, if you just weren't, you weren't really listening to it. You just had it in the background to be like, yo, yeah, fun pop song. But then you're like, you really listen to it. And you're like, Oh, I don't, I don't feel well. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about that. I'm glad you brought this up because we obviously love music and music is a huge part of both of our lives. But like, I feel like I'd be interested to hear Brian's thoughts on that about how people were receiving the album, because I think a lot of times artists know that they're putting stuff out that might be perceived in a completely different way by the public or by critics. But as long as they did it for themselves and they know the meaning and they know that it represents everything that they wanted to say at that time, they're okay with it. But oftentimes the ones that they love the most are not the critical successes and vice versa. So it's really interesting to hear that because, like you said, people might just be like, oh, fun, sugary pop. It's great. But if he felt good about it and he was like, okay, this is the story that felt right for me at the time, he probably didn't care as much. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was what he wanted to. He had been dreaming of, of creating an album like this for so long. He He didn't, he wanted to get away from that kind of like Beach Boys, California, everything's all happy-go-lucky. Um, and it, it did bring ten- – like, he knew that it w- it was different from the Beach Boys sound. And, yeah. in, in fact, it caused tension between the band because – Not surprising. They, they – yeah, they fought over this new direction, particularly Mike Love, who had Ugh, before, which is Mike Love. his cousin. Get out of here, bro. Mike Love. Mike Love did not love this. It, <sighs> it thought it was too arty. Uh, the, the other bandmates just felt like they were kind of treated like musical instruments, and they kind of were in a sense because, as I mentioned before, this was produced almost like a movie where you know you have to get these different pieces perfected, and then he's going to put them all together. Right. And so, on one hand, we have the theremin, and then on the other hand, we just have we need the Beach Boys to harmonize this one part, but mm. the theremin is just as important. So. I can I see where they that, would feel but, like that, yeah. Yeah. But more so, they didn't like the lyrics in, within it, because I think, again, it was just a little bit darker than they were used to. And Mike Love, again, Ugh. just being Mike Love, said that lap, some of the... 
I think maybe Mike Love and Murray were, were close because he said, some of the words were so totally offensive to me that I wouldn't even sing them because I thought it was too nauseating. Um, okay. I, it's hard to say because, uh, we, we didn't grow up at this time. We weren't born in the forties. So I think our, um, our idea of offensive music is very different to Mike Love's (laughs) as, uh, WAP is the number one song out there right now. (laughs) Your new favorite song. I'm just like trying to, (laughs) I'm trying to think like explicitly what he's referencing because yeah. I mean, I, I listened to the album, but I didn't listen to all of the lyrics one by one. But there's no like, there's nothing in there that'd be like, oh no, oh my. Yeah, well, like what that was so taboo in his mind. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was just jealous. Now, well, <laughs> because Mike Lo- Mike Love loved. Uh, he loved formulas. I mean, he he wanted to stick to the safe stuff. He just he didn't understand this whole experimental process for music. He just wanted to stick to the classic Beach Boys formula. He kind of sounds like maybe he was the worst. Just gonna say yeah, it. Yeah, I, I would I wouldn't uh, disagree with that. Uh, well, fun fact: the the name Pet Sounds came from the fact that Mike Love uh, said <laughs> said to Brian, "Who's gonna hear this?" The ears of a dog. So then Brian, maybe in a bit of an F you Wait, I love that. <laughs> Who cares yeah. if dogs are liking it? Mike Love. Maybe dogs listen to it when we're away. All right. It's fine. <laughs> maybe Benny heard it. <laughs> it's like uh, when the, to- uh, <laughs> the toys and Toy Story come alive, you know, when the people leave. Our dogs listen to music. <laughs> They're like, hey, Alexa. Uh, Huckleberry's just <laughs> tapping my his paw to... <laughs> Good vibrations. <laughs> Huckleberry whips out the guitar. He's like, hello. <laughs> Huckleberry has the theremin. And he's, his paws are going over it. Ooh. Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> On that note, let's take a quick break. Hey, Jess, what do you call a pickle lullaby? I don't know, Kate. Tell me. A cucumber slumber number. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I did not see that coming. (laughs) Mm, Nope. That joke may have been the worst, but Design Pickle is not the worst. Definitely not the worst. And there's a reason that Design Pickle has been ranked on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies in America for the past two years. And it's because they aren't the worst. No, Design Pickle offers flat rate, unlimited graphic design and creative services with unlimited revisions, brand profiles, a Zapier integration, Adobe source files, all that good stuff. And we have a special deal for all of you listeners. So if you're listening to our nonsense and you need graphic design help or custom illustration help, you can use the code WORST at checkout to get $100 off your first month of any plan. That's coupon code WORST, W-O-R-S-T, for $100 off. Any plan of Design Pickle, our Essentials plan, our Pro plan, custom illustrations, just head over to designpickle.com and select the plan that's right for you and get $100 off. And get creating. So while he's working on Pet Sounds, he also started working on one of my favorite songs of all time, Good Vibrations. Oh, I love that (laughs) song. Even as I say the name, I'm getting goosebumps. I think that's the song that I probably replayed the most yep. while while uh, researching this i didn't it's know that so it good. was it's so good uh the the story behind it though is, is pretty wild i mean it was the costliest single ever recorded at the time what because, yeah because Why? they had to have all these different like session artists come in recording these weird instruments and just the the composition of of it all took so long I, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was, yeah, it cost the most out of any song, any single recorded Damn. at that time. Well, uh-huh. worth it, because fantastic. Yeah, and <laughs> the title comes with Brian's fascination with, quote-unquote, cosmic vibrations. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I, I mentioned at the top that his mom was probably an alcoholic. I didn't see anything really confirming that. It, it said in Wikipedia that it was like suggested that she was. Mm. Um, but as a child, she would tell him that 
dogs sometimes bark at people in response to their bad vibrations. And that kind of like <gasps> stuck with him his whole life. That's true, though. Yeah, they do. Oh, my gosh. Huckleberry knows when someone has bad vibes. Yeah. Yeah. He'll give, them a, he'll give them a growl. Cray cray. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he'll shoot them in friendly growl. It's fine. <laughs> So that's actually what our dogs are listening to when we're not home. It's just good vibrations True. the whole time. <laughs> they got to keep themselves in check. They're like, okay, okay. <laughs> the mailman's coming. Hold on. I need some good vibrations right now. <laughs> not the Amazon truck. Ah! Oh, no. <laughs> now, Capitol Record execs were worried because the lyrics contained psychedelic overtones. Uh, they thought that it was, you know, recorded under the influence of LSD, but Brian's like, no, it was recorded under the influence of marijuana, not LSD. <laughs> you silly goose. Classic creative. Like, I would never do that. But actually, it was just this, which you guys uh, might yeah. perceive as just as bad, but it's fine. Yeah. Regardless, it, it set a whole new standard for musicians and what could be achieved in the recording studio because it was so crazy the way it was composed and just the thought that you can, like, reverse these scales and add on all these like crazy sounds that you wouldn't hear in music before so it just opened the yeah. door for other musicians to to recreate that now in 1967 he's 25 and the interest in the beach boys really starts to wane at this time like they were kind of written off as being too commercial and just not cool enough you know this is when like we have the beatles the Stones and oh, they sorry, sold out they're playing happy music. Not oh, I'm so rock. sorry. These are surf guys. They're yeah. So they they start recording uh, in in Brian's makeshift studio in his house in Bel Air. Uh, oh, Bel Air. Yeah. Okay. They record an album called Smiley Smile. <laughs> 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 we'll just take a take a beat on that. Take it all in. Smiley smile. It, it ended up being their worst selling album of all time. Okay. The woat. <laughs> yeah. And Brian is pretty much in total seclusion at this point. You know, he still has all these mental health issues. He's he's taken drugs and uh, can't handle the pressure of everything. So the, the Beach Boys tour without him. This I don't think it's at this point, but I just want to add because I don't think it's in my notes, but did you know that John Stamos performed with the Beach Boys? Uh, Kate. You do? Yeah. Because, okay, okay, okay. Because on Full House, that was like a very... That's The Beach right. Boys were actually common guests on Full House, and then I remember like as an adult watching a random episode on TV and looking it up and being like, why did they come on Full House so much? But John Stamos had a really good relationship with them. Yeah, he he was a big fan when they first started out, and then... Yeah. It, it was hard to tell just based off my research, but it almost seemed like he came in when Brian had left and wasn't touring with them. He kind of like filled in. So I sense that there's definitely some tension between Brian Wilson and John Stamos. But it, again, oh, it was weird. it was kind of hard to find information on that. Uncle Jesse. I know. John Stamos. What a cutie. Now, the story that I thought I was originally telling you, but I thought it was very important to include, is in 1968... When Dennis Wilson, so Brian's brother, he is the drummer of the band, who, as you may recall, is the only surfer of the Beach Boys. Sicky, sicky, nar, nar, bruh. <laughs> he, he's driving one day, and he picks up two hitchhikers. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, they invite him home for some milk and cookies, which he obliged. It's, I Sounds mean, creepy. Two, two cute little ladies, Patricia and Ella. Okay. Um, and the, these two ladies are talking to him about their spiritual guru that they love and adore. And he's like, okay, that's cool. A another day, or I, I think it was like the next day or something like that, Dennis is leaving the recording studio with the Beach Boys. Um, and he goes, he's pulling up to his house and sees this like crazed guy standing in his driveway. Oh boy. Um, yeah, so he kind of approaches him like, oh God, what's this? And the guy is like, no, 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 it's cool, it's cool. I'm Charles Manson. Uh, gets down and starts kissing his feet. <laughs> I just got chills, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so the two hitchhikers Dennis had picked up, Patricia Kren Krenwinkel and Ella Jo Bailey, they were two family members of the infamous Charles Manson family cult. Oh god. 
Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Um, as you may or may not know, Charles Manson was a musician, and he really, really wanted a record contract, and he oh knew who the Beach Boys were, and uh, you know, he kind of saw that as like his in. No. <laughs> oh yeah. No. Did you do? You, have you not heard this before? I have not heard this before. <gasps> I know about his story and all the other, but I did not know that he oh. wanted a record deal. God. Uh, they end up like becoming really good friends and hanging out. Uh, but Dennis, 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 who's like has crazy success, global success, has this big house, and he just invites Manson and all of his family members to come stay with them, uh. him in his house. Hmm. Dennis. And I mean, it, it kind of worked out because Dennis, Dennis was like the cute little surfer guy. He's like, he was very handsome in my opinion. Uh, but Charles Manson would like bring drugs and all these beautiful women around. So he was like, sweet, this is awesome. Like, you yeah. we can just hang out in my house and make music and you're going to bring over women and, and drugs. How rock and roll is that? <laughs> But it wasn't it wasn't that normal. Um, our favorite Mike Love also uh, mentions in his his memoir that he went over to to Dennis's house for dinner only to find everyone there naked. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> the after dinner LSD fueled orgy was a little too much to take, <laughs> so uh, Mike Love just excused himself and just uh, he he tried to like hide in the bathroom and Manson barged in <gasps> like got mad at him for trying to leave. So Manson, as we know, is just a complete lunatic, but he yeah. wanted to control the whole situation. And yeah. Well, um, I'm but, like so creeped Den- out right now. I <laughs> know. Uh, they're all just like living in Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys house. <laughs> How like, can we just take a beat to recognize the difference between like a cult and then the happy, cheery music of the Beach Boys? <laughs> like, I know. There is no crossover. At all. Yet there is. <sighs> wow. Yet there is. Yet there is. Wow. Uh, because Dennis actually really believed in, in Manson's musical abilities. He thought no, he was no. like a talented musician. <sighs> um, he set up a recording session through the Beach Boys label. But things uh, took, a, took a turn for the worse because Manson pulled out a knife on the studio engineer when, when things weren't going his way. Uh, things got really ugly there. Dennis just wanted to, like, avoid all confrontation, so he basically just left his house and peaced out and then had his landlord, like, evict the Manson family because he was getting kind of, like, freaked out by them. We could have told you that, Dennis. We could have told you that. Yeah. Well, we know now because what happened was, well, first Manson was, like, threatening Dennis in different ways. Like, he would, like, show him a bullet and be like, you should watch out. Stuff like Ew. that. Uh huh. Um, but because all of this stuff was going down, obviously they ended up like not recording Charles Manson's music, and uh, the record deal was shot down. So because of that, that's what ignited Helter Skelter, the oh, the boy. whole plan to go out and cause mayhem and kill people. So the the infamous house, or I guess the famous house where uh, the first. Like, real murders took place from the Manson family was at uh on Cielo Drive because that's where the studio producer lived oh, and just God. happened to move out a couple months earlier and who's living in that house now is Sharon Tate. So <gasps> that's why mm-hmm. Oh no. We all know how that ended. Gosh. Yeah, so we we know how that ended, but I knew that they didn't know that Sharon Tate was living there, but I didn't realize it was the actual like Beach Boys producer that that's who Charles Manson was trying to kill because of the whole record deal going south. I didn't know that either. Oh my gosh. This is, oh, I feel like we so could do tragic. a whole series on this podcast about all the inner connections yeah. in creativity and artists, like across all different fields, right? Like Sharon Tate was an actress. Manson's a, cult leader but apparently was a musician musician dennis mm-hmm. was like the crossover is insane to me it's so cool but not if people are getting murdered i guess <laughs> i just want to say too this is just my personal opinion but charles manson is just a loser <laughs> i mean well, obviously we all know Ooh, that but you got him 
<laughs> I know, burn. Um, but like, that's literally, he was just such a lunatic loser. And he was just like bitter that he couldn't get a record deal. He wanted to be a rock star and he couldn't get what he wanted. So he would just ruin lives. I just yeah. hate him. Like there are other ways that you can deal with failure, bro. Maybe go get a mm-hmm. hobby. Like maybe not a hobby of killing people, perhaps. That'd That's be ideal. preferable that would for be society, ideal. but whatever. Yeah. The the I mean, there's a lot of things that are sad about this, but uh obviously Dennis pretty much carried the guilt of this from the rest of his life, just feeling his crazy self destructive behavior. He died at age 39. Uh, he drowned, but he was also super drunk. And I don't know if that whole, that whole story, that's, yeah. that's another story for another day. But uh, I think it's just safe to say he was battling these demons and partially because did, there was some of that survivor's guilt of knowing that like, well, because of my actions, my friend, or I thought I, this person was my friend, they end up killing all these people. Like, Yeah, that's heavy shit. Yeah. So... Back to Brian Wilson. As he kind of goes down this interesting decline here, he's already had his big mental break, but things are not great. Um, At the time, the Beach Boys were trying to create this album called Smile. Different from Smile, Smiley Smile. Yeah, I was just going to say, that sounds a little uh, redundant. Yeah. Okay, they want us to smile. That's fine. Uh, (laughs) They ended up canceling that whole recording because things were were going awry. Uh... Brian had his firstborn child, uh, they were struggling, struggling from financial issues, and his drug use got a hell of a lot worse. He started using cocaine on top of all these other psychotropic oh, drugs he's using. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. He does enter a psychiatric hospital, and I did find a ton of information on this, but it seems like, I mean, they were supplying him with lithium, which is one thing, but it seems like he also got electroconvulsive therapy. Oh, boy. Hmm, Yeah. Uh, in 1969, he opens a health food store called The Radiant Radish. Oh, this is that's not really relevant cute. to the story at all. I know. I, would I just wanted to include there. it because I thought it was cute. <laughs> uh, the reason why you can't is because it closed just like two years later because he was just a horrible business person. Not <laughs> he surprising. Didn't want to run a business. Not surprising. Yeah. But yeah, I would shop there. The Radiant Radish. That's so it's hippie and so cute. It's so clever. I feel like now that would be super popular, especially in LA. Are you kidding? Oh, yeah. Someone bring, bring that, that back. back. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> uh, so at this point, I mean, he's just really withdrawn, just brooding. He's a hermit, pretty much. Uh, people would see him just cruising around in the back of a limousine, just bleary and looking a little homeless, just a little strung not, out. not well, not well. Uh, but he's still making music, of course, because that's like the one thing he, cl- yeah. he can cling on to. Uh, he, he was doing home demo recordings, which are informally known as the bedroom tapes. And a lot of these recordings have been unreleased or just the public has never heard them. So <sighs> that could come out someday. But also some of the material has been described as schizophrenia on tape. Okay. Yeah. 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 One quick thing. Um, I feel like the seclusion thing is becoming more and more pronounced the more episodes we do. Like, and you just, your heart breaks for them. And it's almost like they can't relate to anyone because their creativity is so far off the charts that like, they can't be normal and they can't just be around other people because they can't relate to them. You're right. That's such a good point is how do I relate to everyone when my my brain is on a whole other wavelength? But then on top of that, I think just the pressure of uh, success, because that's we see that same thing where it's these artists who are just creative souls and want to create their art, but then they reach global success and fame and then they just turn inward and sad. It's like fame and creativity don't necessarily go hand in hand well. Oh, I really seeing. hope that we don't get famous then. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to, to add to to add to all this pressure, uh, his his father Murray passes away in 1973. Obviously, he had a very uh, interesting relationship with his father, who was abusive, but also their manager, and he looked up to him. So, yeah, lots of mixed emotions there. But after this, he just completely secluded himself. He was just sleeping, drinking, doing drugs, and, and eating. He, he gained a lot of weight at this point. And 
attempted to drive his car off a cliff. Oh, Brian. No. I know. Okay, so this part is crazy. Are you ready for this? No, I don't think Um, I am. So in 1975, things are still really, really bad. He's just on so many drugs. He's he's gained a ton of weight. He's secluded. Uh, And his wife at the time, Marilyn, hires a psychotherapist named Eugene Landy to treat him. Not to be confused Um, with Eugene Levy. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he also has very thick eyebrows and has perfect comedic (laughs) timing. But uh, Actually, no, I don't know what he looks like, but he if he has comedic timing, it is terrible. He is a terrible human being. Um, But his his Eugene Landy basically had uh, a vision to be this like businessman. But he entered the whole psychiatric world um, and had. Bad mm, yeah. combo. As we'll come to find, he used very unorthodox me- methods, and specifically with like this program with Brian, it was like a twenty-four hour intensive psychotherapy. Uh, Brian was he rebelled against it at first, but he ended up going along with things because he was so afraid of of being committed to an institution. Which, uh, quick sidebar, I try I will try not to give any spoilers away. But we were watching an episode of Ozark. Ew. And there's a part where someone potentially gets admitted to uh, an institution and just how terrifying that is. Because you think about like the, these state facilities and you get told that you're crazy and you can't convince people otherwise. and You're just stuck there. Like that's one of my biggest fears, I feel like. Worst is, nightmare. Yeah. Worst freaking nightmare. God. Anywho. Oh, thank you. So Landy ends up diagnosing Brian with as a as a paranoid schizophrenic but he actually wasn't like that was a misdiagnosis uh I mean he had he was hearing these voices and stuff like that but it was more like the LSD induced yeah. uh hallucinations and uh he he later retracted this diagnosis but while he was moving forward with this I mean he just like aggressively was medicating Brian mm. and supervising everything uh A good comparison is basically when Britney Spears had her breakdown in in 2007 and then basically lost control of everything. That's what happened here. This this person just, like, took over Brian Wilson's life. A year later, they actually fire him. It was just a dispute over money, and Brian kind of goes back into using drugs, gaining more weight. He divorces his wife. But uh, a few years later, he overdoses on alcohol cocaine, a plethora of other drugs. Oh, goodness. And, uh-huh. So he's, he's kind of back on that train. But in 1982, uh, Brian was basically, like, fired from the Beach Boys, even though he was the one who, like, made them. Made yeah. Them who they are. They're not the Beach Boys and without it, Brian. Exactly. But they gave him an ultimatum that was, you basically, the only way you can get back into the band and get the money that's owed to you is if you start doing treatment with Dr. Landy again. So he's forced back into working with this guy. Oh. Yeah. And, and right now, Jess is just covering her face because, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so awful. Because it gets worse. So like, bad. things are already bad. He's misdiagnosing him and supplying him with so many drugs that he, like, does not need. Ugh. He breaks away from that in in uh, late 70s, but then they come back to it in early 80s. So, and at this point, I mean, tensions are really high between the Beach Boys. Our favorite, Mike Love and Brian, have restraining orders against each other. And this is when Dennis passes away. So things are just rough all around. Yeah, talk about just bad series of events. Yeah. So I I watched this video. It was like an interview with with Brian Wilson and Dr. Landy. Uh, But it's so awful to watch because you can see how drugged up Brian is. Like, he can barely keep his head up. And Dr. Landy has his – I hate to even say it, calling him Dr. Landy because he's so – awful but he has his arm around brian but is like gripping his arm really tight you can tell it's like it's not in a loving way it's more like i am controlling you he's just talk. he's speaking for him basically talking over him it's just really creepy to watch yeah no kidding Uh and just because he's like pushing all these drugs on he was basically just like his drug supplier at this point he would always have He's like, oh, need some pills? Here you go. He always but, like, had them with him. He's supposed to be helping him with his drug mm-hmm. problems, so the irony is too real. 
well, because of all of this, uh, Brian Wilson develops tardive dyskinesia, which you may recall what that is from your psych classes in college. But that's that condition where you have like involuntary repetitive movements. Sometimes it's like usually like in your face, kind of like mm-hmm. a, a twitch. Uh, but it, it usually develops when you've been treated with antipsychotic drugs for a long time. Yep. Ugh, so people that. people didn't know what it was. Like they thought maybe he had a stroke or something, but no, it was uh, tardive dyskinesia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sounds uh, really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so great. But on top of that, I mean, uh, Dr. Landy's also just getting so much money out of all of this. He's charging the whole like Brian Wilson enterprise $430,000 annually. <laughs> and... Just, but also requesting more money on top of that, giving away a quarter of Wilson's publishing royalties. Jesus. Oh, yeah. You're so right. It has so many parallels to Britney Spears. Mm hmm. Yeah, he takes control not just of his mental health, like all of his financials, uh, who he can talk to. He, he like kept him away from people, uh, would speak for him. It was awesome all weird and later they would find out that he had actually like somehow made himself the chief beneficiary in brian wilson's will Ah! so essentially like if brian wilson died landy would have gotten almost all of his assets which he very well could have because it seems like landy would have overdosed him on purpose Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah now, I, I am bouncing a little bit all over the place here, but uh, in 1986, Brian Wilson walks to a car dealership and he sees this beautiful woman there named Belinda Ledbetter, and he slips her a note that just says, lonely, frightened, and scared. <gasps> oh my god. Yeah. What would you do if you got a note like that from a stranger? I'd probably run away, but I don't know. Maybe she recognized him. It, I guess I don't... I, I, I didn't catch that part like if she knew who he was and yeah because he's already famous at this point you know right like if a stranger a disheveled stranger sent that to me i would be concerned but also a bit frightened if it was like gosh i don't know john stamos handing me that i would be like john you okay do you want to talk good bro so (laughs) that's what happened and they ended up dating but belinda belinda melinda uh, God bless her. She noticed how effed up Landy was and how he was treating her. And Thank God someone was, finally is. Right? She was trying to to keep Brian away from him, but uh, really, like, Landy was pushing back. And of course she, she began was. Fearing, yeah. He, he, uh, Melinda was fearing for her own life. She started, like, recording conversations between her and, and Dr. Landy because she was like... Good. Yeah. So, smart girl. She was on it. But... Uh, as I mentioned, Lanny was his legal guardian and forbade him from seeing Melinda. However, however, she kept fighting, and two years two years later, 1988, eventually everything came to light with how twisted this guy was, and the state of California Board of Medical Quality charged Landy with ethical code violations, and he basically lost his license, and he couldn't be a a doctor anymore thank well it's about damn time yeah they decided that he was you know handling improper prescriptions and just had unethical personal relationships with clients which is very clear to see uh also they included some mentions of sexual misconduct with the female patient um so he had some other things going on there too as if he could not be a worse human he's Mm -hmm. 1000 percent the worst yeah he's he's an awful human being now, moving on back to Brian Wilson, though, he ends up signing a solo record deal, Sire Records. Going back a, a little bit, though, while he is creating this record, Lanny had m- manipulated him into naming Landy himself as a collaborator on the self titled oh Brian God. Wilson album. Spare me. What did he contribute? Uh-huh. Drugs? Drugs, mostly. Yeah, so he was just trying to get royalties. He's like listed as like one of the songwriters. No, you're what not, a dude. Douche. Yeah, but once he's kind of moved away from all of that, Brian ends up releasing two more albums in the 1990s. One was called Orange Crate Art, and this is a collaboration with a uh, musician producer Van Dyke Parks. 
the main reason why I wanted to include this because I mean Van Dyke Parks has worked on just a t- with a ton of different artists, many artists that you'd know, but specifically I want to call out that one of his first jobs was arranging the music for The Bare Necessities in the 1970s. <laughs> Yeah, 1967 film, The Jungle Book. That's a that's a special song between Jess and I. Uh, we won't go into the details, but basically Kate thought it was, um, when she was trying to think of the name of the song, she said, hmm, happy. Oh, yeah, Bare Necessities. <laughs> doesn't translate well to the story, but it's no, one of our favorite, well. our favorite <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Just love that song. So now we're in the 1990s, and uh, Brian Wilson's mental health is, is on the mend now that he's no longer under the, the thumb of Dr. Eugene Landy. Thank God. Yeah, that's, I'm glad he got out of that. Um, he's, he's making music again. He's creating albums with and without the Beach Boys. They actually revisit that uh, the aborted project, Smile, <laughs> the, the album that they he wanted to create before. They did a brief tour then, and and during this time, I mean, he just won a ton of awards, honors. He's in the Hall of Fame, nominated for Grammys. Good for him. Mm -hmm. There's a movie that came out. I I haven't watched it, but uh, Paul Dano earned a Golden Globe for this this movie for his portrayal as young Wilson, and John Cusack (gasps) played him as uh, an older Brian Wilson. Well, I guess we have to add both of those to our list. Now, get this, Paul Giamatti was Eugene Landy. <laughs> oh, I can totally picture him being so good at that role. Right? Me too. Now, I, this definitely adding this to our list. Yeah. He releases a new solo album called No Peer Pressure, but peer spelled like a peer by the oceans. Kind of going back to that whole surfer vibe. Love it. Uh, reached num- number 23 on the album chart, so success like he's he's doing better he's coming back up and at this point you know he's he's there's plenty of interviews if you search for his name now um where he's doing better mentally and just talking about his his experiences and uh he stated that i'm having much more fun than i did as a beach boy because i'm no longer a beach boy i'm brian wilson how very poignant that really just goes to finally found himself yeah like he just his identity was so all over the place when he was with the Beach Boys and the drugs and Landy, like everything that happened to him kind of shifted him from being who he really is, which is so sad. Mm-hmm. He was a, a brilliant musician. He was, he is, he, I mean, he's, he's still alive, but he, he's a brilliant human being, uh, obviously very tortured by his past yeah. and just uh, that classic, like, tortured artist where no one understands him and obviously drugs played a big part but then that massive success that the beach boys got contributed to a lot of it too it's almost like like you said like he kind of got pigeonholed into this one category when he just wanted to create completely revolutionary new music right um but really that leaves us with with the final question is brian wilson the worst I have to say, absolutely not the worst. Was he tortured? Was he complicated? Yes, yes, all of the above. But it's hard to call someone the worst when they've just kind of had a lot of things against them in their lives, you know? Uh-huh. And I feel like we've we've said this before in other episodes, but when you think about how much he has really changed the landscape of yes. the music, uh, it's doing things in the studio that people didn't even know that they could do. And that's what's in a lot of our music today. Totally. Uh, although Brian Wilson may not be the worst. I think it might be safe to say that Mike Love could be the worst though. Yeah. <laughs> our, our favorite. Like, whatever, Mike, get out of here. I just, I don't even want to speak about him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely kind of like the most hated beach boy. He can stick to his formulaic sound that's fine just don't be mean to to the rest of the beach boys exactly just be kind okay mike love just be kind uh i'd love if everyone else could be kind and you know throw us a bone here so subscribe to creators of the worst give us a rating review uh and like i said if if we miss something if i mispronounce all the names wrong (laughs) uh if you just think i have terrible taste in music then message us at podcast design pickle.com tune in next week to find out who really is the worst. Dun, dun, dun. All right, I'm gonna go surfing now. Thanks for listening to Creatives Are the Worst. 
If you like what you're hearing, or if you think that we're the worst, please leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. We'd love to hear from you. You can also contact us directly at podcasts at designpickle.com. And a big thanks to Design Pickle for sponsoring the show. Join us next week as we once again try to answer the question, are creatives the worst? <laughs>